Okay, everybody, welcome. And I only thought 20 people would show up for this one. No, I didn't. I really thought I would get a lot because Sandy's been sending out emails, other people. In fact, I think SVRW sent out a bunch of emails, although they may have sent people to the wrong place. But uh, so there are a bunch of people at Calvary still. <laughs> <laughs> but they may trickle in when they realize it's not there. But uh, I just want to, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming, but I also want to thank Robin, because she's always the uh, mastermind behind these events and makes these happen. So everybody... <laughs> she's all the way in the back there, if you don't know who she is. Uh, and, and she said, make sure everybody picks up their dishes before they leave, because otherwise you'll end up with a bunch of these left here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to open up with a word of prayer, and then I will, um, I don't have your bio in front of me, but uh, <laughs> yeah, just give us a quick update. Yeah, usually I'm, I'm all ready to go. So, dear Lord, thank you for this uh, group here. We pray that you will uh, give them the wisdom, uh, and as they look at the data, and make uh, decisions that are true, and decisions that are valid, and we pray that you will uh, bless Terry as he leads them through this. Uh, showing them the information. I pray that we will all be prepared and educated so then we can take this to our friends. You all know this is the next battlefield. It's a, been an ongoing battlefield, but it's going to take off. So uh, we thank you, Lord, and we pray that you, we will glorify you today in this event. Amen. So let me give a quick intro. I just came from a pastor's conference, and they were talking about one of the topics was the Great Reset. And I ran to a gentleman named Alex Newman. I don't know if you know who he is. But he goes to the World Economic Forum, and he goes. He actually goes to these things. I can't go to them because my stomach turns, and I want to throw up, and I want to beat, and I want to beat up everybody there. So I, I have to stay away from those things. But he's going to Egypt next week and stuff like that. But he did. A, he does a presentation. We're going to bring him here next, uh, next year, uh, probably uh, February or something like that. You guys have to show up, okay? I mean, we have all these great speakers that some of you don't know, but you then don't show up because you don't know who the speaker is, right? So you got to show up even if you don't know the speaker. You have to trust the VAC that we know that these are important people and I've vetted them. So, But one of the things he brought up was the World Economic Forum has a distinct plan that they are making sure that you end up owning nothing and still being happy. You will rent now, who are we renting from? Now, you know, there used to be a, a system back in the Middle Ages called the feudal system, where nobody owned anything except for the elite. And all the peasants rented, and they had to work on the land. They could never own the land. They could only work on the land, and they had to give 50% or more to the overlord. So this is exactly what they're trying to do. And when you look at his presentation, you go, oh, this is what they're doing. This is what they're doing. This is what they're doing. So the one of those is they have to bankrupt everybody so that they are forced to. Now, remember in the Old Testament, during the time of the famine, remember everybody, Joseph tells the Pharaoh, this is what you do. And everybody goes to Pharaoh and goes to Joseph to get grain. And the first year they spend their money, they get the grain. Remember, this is grain that Joseph took from them, right? In the seven years of plenty. But he sells it back to them. So the first year, he just they give him money. The second year, they don't have money, so they give him all their cows. The third year, they don't have money, so they give him all their land. And the fourth year, they don't have money, and they say, we have to sell ourselves to Pharaoh. And, and the Bible says, and so Pharaoh owned all the land of Egypt under Joseph. Right? Now you go, why did Joseph do that? Because this is all part of God's plan to allow the, the children of Israel to prosper in the land. Now, guess who was eliminated from that selling themselves? Well, the family of Joseph, right? Now, now take this and, and look at an evil group of people, and that's what the World Economic Forum is, that's what Soros is, and that's what they're all doing. And one of those key plans is global warming. The lie of global warming, oh, I just revealed my bias, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll see the evidence, uh, is designed for you to end up not owning anything and being dependent on them. And that is one way is to bankrupt your industries, bankrupt your small businesses, bankrupt your, uh, your cow producing business because, oh, they're going to create global CO2 and all that stuff. So it's all part of this. And, and, and to make things worse in California, 
They said that there are no more gas-powered cars sold. You can only use electric. And guess what they did this summer? Oh, you don't, please don't plug in your electric car. Okay. But, but this is, I always say, when anything is so utterly ridiculous, you have to realize it was planned. Because people aren't that stupid to go, oh, yeah, let's not plug in the cars. And then, well, no, they knew that exactly what they were doing, right? So that is the goal, and that's where they're headed. And so this is a key part of that. And the only way we will get out of that is we have to convince enough people to rebel. As my new saying goes, it's too late to wake up the other sheep. It's time to wake the lions. Thank you. A little bit of a sound check. Yeah, there's a great there's a great book by Mark Morano, by the way, called The Main Reason. Knowing Mark. Let's make sure this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I'm really excited to be here tonight. I see a few friends. Mike, good to see you. Uh, and Sandy, whom I met and talked to on the phone a hundred times already. So I don't know. It's a it's a virtual world. And you're probably wondering, uh, first of all, I've got a lot to cover this evening. So, you know, you can, you can probably, if you get too lost, I'm, I'm here for the duration. So, you know, there's no uh, other speaker after me. And we can, uh, you know, we can, I can get some questions from you during the course of the event. But we have to keep that, obviously, at a minimum. I've got a lot of slides to go through. I'm going to try to make this an hour long. This is, this is what's not being taught in schools. Uh, and it's the science that's missing in the curriculum. And so what I'm really going to be concentrating on today is not a political speech. I could give that, uh, you know, the main reset, uh, intersectionality and such. You know, it's, it's all there for people to review and think about. But I think the part that's missing often and I see this uh, through a lot of my friends, and you'll see a lot of their material in my presentation, is the idea that people can understand it in some degree in total. So I'm going to get through the science to a point where you will know what certain things mean, and you'll be able to say and ask questions to someone. And this is going to be available. I think it's being recorded. And so, you know, it'll be available. John, you want to flip the lights maybe? I think that's a good time. Um, it's uh, and tell me if it looks better because I really yeah that that looks better. I won't see your faces as much, but so you know uh, first of all why the why the title science versus declarations and we're going to get into this in some detail before I you know really introduce the first section of the material because we've had a lot. That we, we live in a declarations culture right now. This is something, something, the worst ever. So let's see if I can work the... Oh, I already got ahead of myself. So what is science? And I don't know if you can read this. It, it, um, basically, this is going to be available. I can make this available in PowerPoint. It's a shame the font is too small, as Neil reminded me. Uh, but, you know, science is basically making assumptions, testing those assumptions and the hypotheses that come out of those results, getting to a theory that then can be debated and reviewed and so on and so forth. And until proven wrong or, you know, confidence is gained. So this is, this is the idea of seeking uh, truth and knowledge. And this is where most of us, as I view the room, there's a few that don't, know what this means exactly, but most of the people who are here, judging from your age, you've been, you understand this part of, of this equation uh, called science. So science is, is, is actually never settled. And I think when, whenever you say the science is settled, that's, that's, a quick, that's a quick declaration, and the declaration is false. And so we're going we're gonna to cover that in, in a way from the bottom up, through the science. The declarations are, I think this is the best I could come up with, are in many ways the, the insertion of unverified facts to support a supposition that there's, there's an overriding narrative that there is 
danger ahead. So you've seen a lot of those. And I think the approach is, is, the, the, uh, is the reliance on selected experts to make declarations. And so you've seen a lot of that in COVID, you've seen a lot of that in, in you know, probably uh, climate is at the top of the queue. And climate is probably more advanced because there's been fewer debates and discussions. Whenever you say, well, the, the science is settled, what that's translating into, the debate is over. And, you know, uh, Feynman, to many of you who do not know Feynman, he's an MIT grad. He went, he solved, if you remember that, that uh, you know, satellite that went down, and, and he solved the problem. He went back through and found that the O-rings were leaking. They froze. Thank you. And so, you know, his, his, his particular position is the scientific method requires debate and so on and so forth. And I think that Einstein said it very well, and he wouldn't do very well in, in climate science today, climate alarmism science, uh, because he said, and I quote him, try to quote him you know, as exactly as I can, I only need one scientist to prove me wrong. I don't need a hundred to prove me wrong. So the idea is that you're focused on the truth. So join me. This is going to be an interesting journey tonight, and I expect that for many of you, you will continue this discussion. I know several of you, uh, Sandy and Mike and a few others, maybe Elizabeth, will, and some I don't know the names of, will join me in a way that, that you know, makes sense to, for me to transmit as much as I can. And... You know, I, th I think that science is, is something that's under, if you're not aware, it's very much under attack at various institutions in the country. And, you know, I think uh, one thing I can say, if I, <laughs> if I don't get too emotional, is that I'm here because of science. Right now, I'm here because of science. I've been fighting cancer all year, and it's because of the scientific solutions that were in place I've survived, and I think I will survive. So, you know, I went and, and I created this talk as a result of, of that sense of purpose. So I think the hero's journey is that for many of you, many of the younger people, this, is, this topic is going to affect their lives in a very, uh, very specific way. We won't get into too much of the outcomes in this particular talk, because I want to concentrate on the understanding of what I would call, you know, good climate science. And I, and I have to start also by saying that there's a lot that's not known about the climate. For anybody to say that science is settled, that's like saying that we know everything we need to know about the human body. And we all know that's not true. I know it's not true for me. I mean, I, I you know, it's, it's uh, who knows what my future is going to be in terms of healthcare or in terms of health. And, and for many of you, that's the case. So, you know, I think that climate may be the most complex system on Earth. And, and you know, the body, human body, is right there neck and neck with, uh, with the climate. So what is Earth? Now, we're going to get into Earth and study it. Well, first of all, Earth is 72% covered by water. If you landed on the planet today, and you looked at this, you would say the water is affecting the climate. That is the source of climate. And by the time we finish tonight, you will understand, you will understand how to explain that to people. And you will wow them with what you know. So I'm, I'm stop selling. But you know, the surface velocity at the equator, it's a 24,000 mile uh, circumference at the equator, and it's 24 hours of uh, night to day and back again. It is going 1,000 miles an hour. I, I don't really feel like it's going 1,000 miles an hour here. I'm glad for that because of gravity. And so, you know, you have that. But the, the idea of 1,000 miles per hour says that things are mixing a lot. And we're going to talk about that as well. How do things mix in the atmosphere? And, and the oceans are very complex. But the ocean is where the climate starts. And you don't hear that. You won't see that in any textbook that's, that's being used in school today. And the atmosphere weighs 700 tons per capita. 
the total atmosphere, and we're going to get into the atmosphere rather extensively, but 700 tons. So your job, if you're an alarmist, or you think this is going to have to happen, you're if you're an alarmist, you're saying that each of you can drive up the temperature of 700 tons by four to six degrees centigrade by the end of the century, or your replacement can drive up the, that, that temperature. That's a lot of weight to cause a temperature change in. So you get the, you get the appreciation of the size of the claims being made. Now, I'm sorry for the lack of detail, but what this, what this really basically says is that, or the, I'm sorry for the, the too much detail, is, is that the equator is right here. And the equator is, you know, plus or minus the rotation in the axis change from summer to winter and so on. The, the equator is where the sun shines the most. And where the sun shines is where the hot, hottest temperature is going to be on Earth. And so you see a lot of, you know, you see a lot of activity. You see a lot of tropical storms starting near the equator. And if they go north and they have the right conditions, they become a hurricane. We won't cover that here because that's, that's, a, that's another meeting. But you can see that the, that the dynamics of the, the turning of Earth mixes things in a way that is very complex. And in fact, is not modeled very well at all. And we'll come to that as well. So this is, this is one good chart to show. And I know Willie Soon, who generated this, is uh, someone some, some of you probably have met. I know Mike has met him and Carolyn. But uh, I, I think many of you perhaps have seen him and, and seen his videos. He's a good friend of ours. So anyway, if you look at this, this is the absolute temperature sense, and I'll have to read it to you. I don't know if there's a focus you can work a little bit, John, but it's, this starts in 1890. So this is 120 years of data. Can anybody, this is the absolute, you know, uh, T max is the yellow at the top, green is T average. So it's during the course of the day and the month. And so there's seasonal variations put in this and so on and so forth. So if you could say, that the hot temperature, which is the top one, the orange lines there, if you looked at that, you could, if you can pick off any serious trend for the last 120 years, you are my master. Because there is no significant trend. And we'll get into other temperature representations. And so think of this, remember this, there's, there's probably, I'll have to tape this down, John, you're right. Uh, you know, there, there is, there is uh, you know, some value in looking at the absolute values as well as the incremental values. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Where do you want it? I don't know, it's, it's probably... Just that's right here. here. It just keeps flapping, right? Okay, that's good. Now you got to. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I'm, I'm wounded. I, <laughs> you know, I, I love this great uh, uh, intro to a speech, and Sandy can use this anytime she wants because she's a doctor. But um, this guy gets in front of an audience like this, and he says, "I'm sorry, I just came from my doctor, and I'm under very strict instructions. I cannot accept any criticism whatsoever." <laughs> Surgical tape. Every good speaker has to carry surgical tape. I guess so. I, <laughs> you're you're speaking a lot more than I am, Neil. Trust me. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Or we need surgery, or anybody comes in from some other group. So this is over 120 years. This is somewhat significant. I think that's that's, uh, and I think that. This is the overview of what I'm going to be talking about. And there's a lot here. I'm going to go through it a little bit now, but we're going to get through this tonight somehow or other. And I think, Han, if you can do a time check at about a half hour, I'd appreciate it. So, you know, how energy flows. We're going to get into how the energy flows in the atmosphere because, in fact, energy in must equal energy out or things get hot or cold. 
So we'll talk about how the energy flows. Gas is in the atmosphere. The whole idea of what you're hearing and the proclamations that you're hearing have to do with CO2 in the atmosphere and the fact that it's increased so much and it's doing so much warming. You're going to walk away tonight, uh, hopefully, with a good understanding, some understanding, and we'll keep improving that understanding uh, as to why that is a very, very shaky ground, shall we say, and, and not actually very true. And then the spectrum of radiation. I really want to give you a little more science than you're probably prepared to stomach tonight, but I'm going to walk you through it, get you into what the spectrum of, you know, the, the, the optical outgoing energy looks like. And then the claims for CO2, I tried to highlight that in font. So what we're looking at then is what are the claims being made? I'm not going to go into all the bizarre claims, but I'm just saying this is what people are saying about CO2. We're going to concentrate on what's the science say, not how to respond to them. And the history of Earth's climate is rather interesting because it goes back 4.7 billion years. You can measure through various ways and through various proxies what that temperature and CO2 looks like all the way for 4.7 billion. You don't see that in the New York Times because it doesn't favor you know, their narrative. Enough of, enough of the advertising. Okay, climate models is, if you don't have a climate model that predicts you know, rather significant warming, then, then you're out of business. If there's no prediction that holds any water, People will say, well, come back when you get a prediction that scares the hell out of me by the end of the century. So that, that's, but there's a lot of stuff in the climate models that is, uh, is something of, you know, of, of value to concentrate on. So I'm going to touch on that in several slides. And then what does CO2 do for the Earth? What does CO2 do? Is it really a pollutant? We're going to cover it on that as well. And then uh, I'm going to get into, you know, conclusions and, and, uh, you know, Q&A. And, and now I've got to probably pick up the speed a little bit. So anybody wants me to slow down, just give me a time outside. Uh, okay, so we said that the, I said that the energy in, which is coming from the sun, no surprise, the 99.9 something percent of the energy coming into Earth is from the sun. And it takes eight minutes to transmit from, from a body that's 200 times hotter than Earth that takes eight minutes for that, for that energy to get here. So it doesn't take very long. Sun is a very interesting topic of its, of its own. And so I think what, you'll see, what you're seeing here in this chart, and this, is, this has got a lot of details. I'm only going to touch on a few things. feedback or something? No, just your plosives are... Closer. Okay, Bye. thanks. Thanks, Neil. Does that, does that work better? Say a few P words. P? Perfect. Okay, so what you're, what you're seeing in this chart is that the, the energy from the sun is in yellow. And the energy leaving the Earth, and it's interesting that they only show this in the landmass, the energy leaving the Earth is in red and purple. And we'll touch on this in more detail. This has got a lot of detail. This has also got a lot of fallacy in it because this is being used by a number of different people. Um, and you know the, the one that's the largest outgoing energy, sun brings energy to us, and the largest outgoing energy is actually the purple over on the right. And the purple has to do with conduction and convection. And then the radiation the infrared radiation kicks in. And that's the one that's being chosen that affects CO2 and affects you know, the uh, outgoing energy from, from the Earth effectively. It's a, it's a, it is, as I said, a pretty complex or, you know, system. So what's in the atmosphere? Well, nitrogen, oxygen, you know about that. You know oxygen because we're standing and we're talking and so on. And, and then you go down the list and argon, carbon dioxide is really the beginning of what's called a trace gas. Now trace gas, for those of you, I'm not a chemist, I'm a, I'm a phys physics double E kind of guy. 
the trace gas is something that's really down in way down in the in the subsection of of you know the big building. It's down in the basement level five. It, this is not a very populated gas in terms of number percent of volume. If if you were to measure CO two in the atmosphere, it's about four hundred parts per million, or 0.37. I think in this in this table is 0.37 percentage by volume. And so what we're looking at then is if you're talking to someone and you can you can use this as a party trick, okay? You can say, you know, this this climate change is something we really need to be worried about. I think any person, no matter what their denomination, whatever you want to call it, whatever category list you want, if they're if they're emitting while they're standing in a room, if they're emitting a hundred times more than the ambient outside, they should stop that immediately. They should just cease and desist. Well, when you're breathing out, you're breathing out at a hundred times the level of CO two in the outside, and you know there's no real problem by doing that. But the ones down the list, there's others that methane, you know what methane is, natural gas, effectively. That's a, even more of a trace gas. And there's a whole list of others. that Ozone, you know about the ozone layer. We got indoctrinated about the ozone layer. And we'll show, I'll show you, basically, uh, I won't show you a layered version of the atmosphere. It's too much for tonight. But I'll show you some of the things that happen in the spectrum in, in terms of UV being blocked by uh, O2 or o by O3 effectively. Um, and greenhouse gases. Well, we all recognize that as a greenhouse. What does a greenhouse do? Well, a greenhouse stops conduction and convection. It does not stop infrared radiation unless it's designed to do so. So you shut the door and, you know, it warms up inside if, if it blocks the release of the energy from within, it isn't being conducted into the outside. If you walk outside with that short sleeve shirt, you're going to feel cold. That's the, that's the issue. This protects us, keeps the warmth in. So in effect, really, the greenhouse, using the word term greenhouse gas, is really strictly incorrect. But, you know, that's a nit. It's now a common, common practice. And... What is it? I, I want to demonstrate this, and I hope I don't knock the microphone off. But so a greenhouse gas is a triatomic molecule. Triatomic molecule is three atoms, CO two, C plus two O two, methane, CH four. So that's five five molecules. And what you know. Nitrogen, hot hydrogen, or nitrogen and oxygen are happy to see the radiation just go right on to outer space. And we could be breathing, you know, we could be breathing O2 and we'd be sort of fine. We'd be a little bit cold, but we'd, we'd be okay. But with, with, with the elements of CO2 involved, what the CO2 does is it, I don't know how many of you know what a photon is, but it's an incremental call it a, a basic unit of energy that's optical. When you're looking at the sun, you're looking at a lot of photons streaming into your eyes. And I don't obviously suggest you do that. But, but you know, the, the visible range, uh, and we're going to touch on the visible versus UV and plus infrared. But when you, when you uh, have energy, optical energy, that matches the characteristics, the quantum mechanics, of a triatomic molecule, then that molecule is going to absorb that photon. And it does a little dance. It's doing this, it's twisting, it's turning, it's doing all that. So what ends up happening is that if it's near the Earth's surface, it probably collides with another molecule about here, about six feet up in the air, from here to here, six feet. So if there's an infrared uh, photon, which is, you know, the radiation energy that we'll spend a lot of time with tonight, the radiation energy coming up, it'll be grabbed by a CO2 uh, molecule or a methane or whatever, uh, and it will absorb that energy. But before it can put it in its wallet, 
an N2 or O2 molecule comes along and takes it away. And how does it take it away? Well, you can see that the collision here, it you know essentially rams into the CO2, and the CO2 has to give up that energy. So the whole idea, uh, and I'm going to refer because I think the audience is, is okay with this, the whole idea that CO2 stores energy in the atmosphere is probably not very accurate. It's definitely not accurate near the Earth's surface. <clears throat> because if it takes one second to capture the CO2 or to re-release the CO2, I should say. Or I'm sorry, to release the, the infrared radiation. And it only takes a nanosecond for the collision to take it away. So you know there's quite a difference in time between those two. And by the way, I think if anyone wants the, the, the PowerPoint presentation, I can email it to you. So you'll have plenty of opportunities to, I want you to kind of absorb, not the gritty details, but, but uh, you know, as I said, raise your hand or something if you want me to explain a little bit more. And so, you know, the whole idea that, that CO2 is, is really uh, dominating, you know, the infrared energy as it's leaving is really a mistake. Uh, so this is this is hopefully not going to put many of you to rest. And really, what I want to do is I want you to concentrate on this graph. This is an important graph. You will wow your friends if you can explain this graph. So you see on the the vertical axes, you see the intensity, and it's usually measured in watts per square meter. That's that's pretty straightforward. If you walk up to a hundred watt, you know, bulb, and you put your hand, you know within a certain distance, you can feel that there's energy coming off that bulb in, in a whole lot of ways. And then the x-axis is, uh, is wave number, and that's the inverse of the wavelength. Sorry about that, but you're going to get used to these terms as I, as I build my case. So this is, this is something called a Stefan Boltzmann, don't worry about the term, and a Planck distribution. And what I'm saying, why I'm saying this to you is that there's absolutely no disagreement with this curve or the science behind it. Nobody disagrees with it. And you'll see this little notch here. And I think many of you cannot, unfortunately, see, you know, the, the, the degrees Kelvin that go next to it. If you go up in the curves, that means that the radiation is coming from a hotter source. If it's a hot day in the tropics on land, you're probably up at the top. And we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna show you something that and I'm gonna show it to you because you you can absolutely use this as a as a party trick. So that's that's you know with uh, UV would be on the right hand side in this curve, so it's over here. And uh, the infrared is on the left-hand side. Okay, now this is the spectrum looking up at the sun. Now, what am I looking at here? I'm looking at from two locations. The yellow is at the top of the So, I think, should be okay, yeah. The, the yellow is at the top of the atmosphere. So you're looking right at the sun. And so there's not a lot of things going on, nothing to really disturb it. But the green is interesting because the green kind of shows you, you know, what, what uh, greenhouse gases can do to disturb the energy from the top of the atmosphere, which is above where you fly in an airplane. Okay. I'm going to talk about that some more too. But it, it goes down. And you can see uh, what I want to point out to you here. Yeah, I think we need to move this. I think we can. No, I think it keeps dropping lower, so it needs to come up a little bit. Oh, sorry for this, Neil. No, no, no. Sorry, everybody. We got lots. Okay, thanks. Another thanks, one? Surgeon. No, that's perfect. <laughs> okay. V for perfect. Okay, so if you could see this graph, I'm going to kind of describe it, so because many of you can't see it, particularly from the back row. What you would see is that there, the green. Um, sections have a lot of they have a lot of notches in them and the first notch on the left here is the ozone layer 
And you'll see that the at the top, you can see ultraviolet light is up at the top. And so that's really high, really high frequency, short wavelength light. And so as you move to the right, you start seeing the dominant greenhouse gas and water vapor is the dominant greenhouse gas. By far the dominant greenhouse gas. Another party trick. And so you'll see the notches. There's another notch. Water kills it. And we'll see more of this, uh, more of this type of curve. But what I wanted to show you here is just two things. Two things. I don't want you to dwell too much on the details. There's three here. And the three charts are taken above different sections of the Earth. One's above the Sahara. It's at the top of the atmosphere. Another is above the Mediterranean. And the third one is above one of the ice caps. Now you'll notice that the third one, if you had this in fine detail, the third one actually has a little bump right there. It's, it's a more energy is being released to outside of the atmosphere from that area. And that means that it's cooling the ice cap. More energy out from a section in the spectrum means that it's cooling that, that particular that particular area. Uh, and so that happens to me that what that means is that CO2 is actually cooling the ice caps. Let that dwell for a second. CO2 is actually cooling the ice caps, both Antarctica and Arctic. And the one on the left here is sort of how does the energy come in and how does the energy go out? And you see that the ice caps play an important part. That red line is the net uh, long wave radiation. And so that's, that's uh, you can see it's occurring at the caps, both north and south. So more energy going out at the ice caps than coming in, which makes kind of sense because of the angle of the light. Okay, so this is, this is probably the most important curve I'll show you. And, it, and even though you probably can't see it, it's, a, it's what's called a one-dimensional model. So it's not a measured value, but it agrees very well with measurement. So what I wanna, wanna point out to you is that it's, it's actually three cases of CO2 that are being used in the calculation. I don't know if you can see across the top of that notch, there's a little green wavy line. That line, that green line represents the no CO2 case. If we didn't have CO2, Earth would be four degrees cooler, we'd be cold. We'd be cold. It'd be four degrees cooler, and you know we would not be breathing because we put out CO2. And by the way, you'll see more in a, in a short while about what the plants, how the plants would be suffering along with us. And so what, what the, um, there's a notch here and there's two actual, unfortunately you can't see it, but there's two actual cases that overlap each other. One is for the nominal CO2 that exists today, the 400 parts per million. And the, uh, the one that is a little red is the one that's calculated for two times the CO2, which is the favorite case of many alarmists to take twice the current at the end of the century. What are we dealing with? And if you look at this very carefully, there's a very small difference between them. And if you integrate that difference, you get a very small number. Why is that the case? It indicates, this graph indicates that CO2 saturates in its absorption of infrared energy. And it can only absorb in, in, this, in this section. It, it says frequency one over wavelength. But in that, in that one over wavelength, it only can absorb 8% of the admitted radiation, which is not the dominant energy being released from Earth. So this is, as I say, if you get into the subject, we're going to be spending more time with this and other curves like it. Okay, so I'm going to read this to you very quickly. So what are the claims being made about CO2? You read them 
every single day. I read them twice a day. I look at, you know, what's going wrong in, in this section, what is supposed to be happening over here. And I, I know that's another fiction piece, but, and, and they say, well, oh my God, there's something going wrong with this and ever. And you're going to be seeing lots of temperature curves that suggest otherwise. And the other thing is that there's no other natural explanations for what the temperature is doing right now. No natural things that can be used to explain what's happening to the temperature right now for the last, probably, I would say the last uh, 40 or 50 years. And I'm going to dispel that, that claim. And the next one is that the, there's, the computer models show that we're in a disaster of our own making. 2100 is burn it to the ground, baby. And we should have stopped the use of fossil fuels and starved to death much earlier. So your grandkids and whatnot can suffer through that. And man's emissions dominate uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere, and CO2 is the dominant driver of temperature. You will, if you study this presentation, I'm sorry, it, you know, again, you will understand how you can argue against all of these claims. So let's, let's start with geological data. And this goes back effectively 570 million years. I hope that's long enough ago for some of you. I, uh, but there's two things represented here. And I, I don't want to touch on any of the, of the ice ages. Is it 30 minutes? In five minutes. Okay, so I've got uh, CO2 parts per million is in the, is in the green. And the, the, the blue, this blue is temperature. So the green indicates that it's on a downward spiral. And uh, I'm going to probably end up going through some of the graphs pretty quickly uh, as a result of the timing. So you can actually make CO2 too low and you'll kill the planet. If we go into an ice age, we, will, we, we risk killing plants and all humans on board. And that's, that's not speculation. So I'm going to I'm going to really underscore the things that are really non-speculative, and so that that shows you what, and we'll see other. You know, I'm going to show you a couple of these, but rather quickly. Now, people say that you know the CO2 correlated at least it's correlated to temperature. Well, this this particular scatter plot, and for those of you who are used to scatter plots, this particular scatter plot shows um, you know the the degree centigrade versus CO2 parts per million. So CO2 is increasing to the right, temperature is increasing going up. And what, what, uh, what you can say from this based on the idea of, of statistical analysis is that there's no correlation whatsoever. There's no correlation between CO2 in this time period, which is 1999 to 20, 2015. So we've been told that CO2 is a big driver, it's going out of control. And, and yet it doesn't correlate to temperature in this recent time period. And you can go back and, and, uh, and see something that's in, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the correlation. Does, does CO2 increase before the temperature increases? Because that's what Al Gore showed in the movie. I mean, it's an award-winning movie. Can't argue with that, right? So... Or does CO2 actually lag behind the temperature increase? In this, in this analysis, in this set of curves, which you can't see, it shows that the lag is something like 800, 700 years. That the temperature rises, and then 700 years later, CO2 increases. It's pretty hard to call CO2 the driver of the climate in that particular case. So that's another mark against the claim. Okay, so let's let's move on. This this actually coming to the natural causes. This is generated by some really fancy uh, AI and big data techniques. 
And what it shows in two different locations in the world for the time at which, uh, you know, 1880 uh, to present time in both of the curves, one's in China and one's in the Northern Hemisphere. And you would say, that's, that's pretty decent correlation. So this is actual solar radiation energy versus temperature. And so you'd say, okay, that's, that, makes, that makes the cut. Um, and I think that what you're seeing then is that, is that solar radiance, the variation of the solar energy, and you don't see that, you don't hear that, because what is being told to many people and taught in school is that there is no significant solar variation. The IPCC models and so on and so forth in literature said there's no significant change in solar radiance. But here we go. We've got some analysis. Really doing some very detailed study of the sun by a, by a sun person who is an expert, and he's a good expert. So th there you go. You've got, some, you've got a natural cause that can lead us to, to that. And now we also have something called the Milankovitch. There's a person by the name of Milankovitch who said, you know what? I think that there's some correlation here to these ice ages between the orbit of Earth and the Sun. Now, just another factoid that, that uh, maybe you don't need right now in the evening, but anyway, is that when, when Neptune, uh, not Neptune, when Venus and Saturn line up to have the maximum gravitational pull on the Sun, the Sun moves 50,000, the center of the Sun moves 50,000 miles in that direction. So the solar system is pretty dynamic. It wants to song and dance. It wants to be a g greenhouse gas and really have a good time. So this again, it, it shows you that there are other natural causes that are orbital. And I'm going to, um, this is the 4.6, uh, you know, 4,600 million years. And so this gives you the temperature. The temperature has been hotter. The, the, where we are today is right in here. And you can see that the temperature has been, sometimes has been at a higher temperature than what IPCC and all the alarmists are saying right now will happen by the end of the century when we burn it down. So, and here is, again, more of the same. Now, if you look at the Earth, what's the first thing you see? Well, you see a bit of the water, but what, the white stuff. What's the white stuff? It's the clouds. So we're going we're gonna to now shift into climate models. And the climate model modelers say, to this day, not in public, to this day they say we cannot model clouds. If you go back to that incoming, you have a variation of, of clouds over the Earth's surface from 40%. This is more than that now, I think, in this picture. It, to as much as 70% coverage by clouds. Clouds either collect energy or they reflect it. The incoming energy in the Earth can bounce off clouds. We all know that. They're white. You're, you get on a plane, what do you see? You see a lot of white clouds up 25,000 feet up in the air. And the net net of that is that you're, you know, you're reflecting that energy that otherwise would get through to the Earth's surface. So now we're gonna we're gonna venture in to do the models work. And if we can if on top of all the other claims that we've discredited, can we can what do we say about the models? Well, first of all, the models uh, or CO2, I'm gonna actually come back to that one. The models are a three-dimensional mesh. And so it's like chicken wire in a computer. And the, and the chicken wire basically has, to, you're computing, you're actually computing values. Physics should be well represented in equation form. And you're actually computing it at the intersection of a grid. So, you know, there's not, not a heck of a lot of grids for that 24,000 mile, you know, equator. And so you'll see a little bit more about how badly represented, we knew this already, but how badly represented we are in the state of California by even the grid size. So you can see that, that the grid size, and then you have, 
you have you have to go up into the atmosphere and maintain the grid and you should be doing a good job of modeling the oceans so someone did a, a, a mathematician in canada very good mathematician in canada said okay i'm going to run this simulation what i if i'm going to run the simulation by using the accurate nonlinear nonlinear models at a at a resolution size grid size that gives me low error and theoretically low error and i'm going into the oceans and i'm going up into the up into the atmosphere and he then computed how much compute time if he used the entire compute power of earth so take all those you know chips that are coming out every year and the last 20 years worth of chips and you you have the compute power and so if you did that how long would it take 10 to get i think it's something like 20 hours 20 days i'm going to say 20 days of of climate prediction accurate climate prediction how many years of compute time compute time would it take 10 to the 20th years a long time so there's a lot of compromises that have to occur because earth is complicated would you simulate the body i don't think so everybody is so different okay and i think california is a two by six grid i've asked i've asked scientists who don't know much about climate i've asked them okay so you're going to model california and you've got to position a grid how many how many grid sizes grid points would you pick you know, what's the total number you pick? Just out of the top of your head, your gut feel. And one guy said, a million. I said, uh, you know, back when this was, ta this was taken, and it's probably about at least 10 years old, um, you know, there would be essentially 12 to 30 grid points. He goes, what? You can't, can't get any accuracy from that. So really what we're dealing with is, do you like the resolution of the photo on the right? That's what you're getting out of the computer models, as opposed to what you're seeing on the left. So and and then you've got to you've got to use the image on the right to predict what's happening 80 years from now and set the appropriate policy. Okay, so here's where we are, and I'm gonna I'm now gonna pick up this pace a little bit because I'm I want to keep your interest. And so really, the red line is the average of 100 models. Why in the world would you average models? Is there an average airplane? Is there an average person? Is that relevant? No, I don't think so. But that's what that's what often is done. The the ones down below are observations. So these are verified balloon data, very accurate data, and satellite data is in the blue. And you'll see more of that in a minute. So now what we're getting is we're getting the discrepancy between the models and actual that's larger than the value of the actuals. And so if you did seasonal variation, where do the models go? Being able to actually model the seasonal variation on Earth is very important to the accuracy of the models. And so the, the clump, the scatter plot in the center is all these computer models. And the, and the X in the lower left-hand corner is the actual. Again, didn't pass the test. And there's another thing called the hotspot up in the atmosphere. And the hotspot is uh, the observations, which is the lower set of curves, is in, definitely in discrepancy with the upper model data so again, they're not passing the test. And this is, to, to add insult to injury, we've got a rural section of the states. So it's, this is Iowa as we love it. It's in the Corn Belt. And so the, you know, the actual observations are down below. And they're, they're rural, which means that they're verified and, and uh, accurate. They're not near a city. City distorts the temperature data just quickly. And so the red, the red curve, the upper curve, and it's starting to diverge rather significantly from the observed. 
And so this is again showing you that the models are overemphasizing. And no surprise if I asked you, what are they overemphasizing? They're overemphasizing the effects of CO2. This is again saying the same thing. If, if you look at the model data and you look at the actuals, there's, there's quite a difference. Okay, so let's come back to the spectral uh, response. And this is important, and, and you'll see it again in more detail, so I want to refresh your memory. This is the wavelength on the bottom. So long wavelength is infrared, probably starts about here. And then the ultraviolet is over here. And all greenhouse gases, including O3, CO2, water vapor, and you can see, um, you know, what's happening in, in CO2. CO2 is 8% is of the total energy that is being blocked by, or captured, or whatever you want to call it, by uh, the greenhouse gases. So this is, this is rather significant. And o, H2O, water vapor, goes up. It keeps climbing in the atmosphere. You know, you think, oh, it's a humid day. You know, it keeps climbing. You visit Florida, it's humid. You visit Texas, it's humid. And so it goes up to a certain point. What happens in the afternoon? Rain, yeah. <laughs> well, what happens is all that water went up and it condensed. What happens when water condenses? You form clouds. Actually, the formation of clouds releases infrared energy up into the higher parts of the atmosphere. So. And, but you also can get you can also get rain, and the models don't represent rain, ice, or any seasonal variation at all. It's it's quite surprising that they can make the claims they're doing. Okay, moving right along. So this is this is the same curve you saw a minute ago. It shows you the average of the 102 uh, models. And, and uh, it also shows you the individual models. So now you're seeing the variation between a model that was cooked in Russia, a model that was cooked in uh, some other country, and so on and so forth. Why, do, why are there so many? When you rub two fingers together, what does that mean? Money. And you're going to see a bit of, of a, ta a table. I want to get to that table for sure. But you know what? What you say is that there's a lot of money in modeling. Uh, it's interesting that some friends went off and looked at the balloon data, and they realized the balloon data. What the balloon data is? You've seen you've seen these people taking this balloon and releasing it into the atmosphere, and they do it in some locations. They do it several times a day, and they do it all around the world. Why would they do that? They've got the models, right? Why would they need to do that? But they do that because that data that they collect at 500 and 1,000, I think it's uh, meters, uh, is used for forecasting the weather. And weather is important because that shows what you need to do tomorrow if you're you know, running a business or growing a crop. So really, the balloon data is voluminous. Well, the Irish, uh, good friends, actually, Irish engineers, along with Willie Soon, who's, who left Harvard just a little while ago, and they said, where's the data? And they went off and they just determined that there's a lot of data that no one has ever looked at before. None of, the, none of the climate scientists are looking at it because they're too busy making. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these things that it's a revolving door. Once you're, once you're going through the revolving door, you can't ask a question and so on and so forth. Now, this is actual satellite data from when satellite data could be accurately taken, which is about the 1980 time period. So this is 40 years worth of satellite data. It's pretty significant. Now, have, how many of you seen or heard the term the pause? Nobody? I think Mike has seen it. You've, okay, a couple people have seen it or heard it. And the pause is, is basically this time period in here. So it's about 15 years. And uh, you can see that at best, you know, this, this curve over a 40 year time period has gone up like a degree. So let's divide, uh, 
divide for, uh, the one degree by probably more than, yeah, there's about four decades here. So you divide that by four and you can get the so much per decade. And so you, you about 0.2 per decade. And if you go out 80 years, then you've got, you know, a linear extrapolation. Well, this is not a, not a linear problem. So it doesn't really give itself to that. They try to use that, but it's, it doesn't really work. But this is, this is something that I send out every month. I know Rick sees it when I send it out and Mike sees it. And Sandy now sees it. Okay, so oceans. Now, I'm not going to try to walk you through this, but ocean currents are really interesting. There's one ocean current that takes 100 years to complete. 100 years for an ocean current. I'm not going to wait for the surf to go up for 100 years. I'm sorry. So, but you, you can see that this is a north, you can't see, but this is the North Pole. And this, this red uh, piece right here is the warm, the warm ocean water coming from the tropics going up into the Arctic region and maybe even melting ice. Okay, comes from the tropics. So that's how complex the Earth is. And so really the issues uh, with the model, and I'm not going to read this to you, the oceans are not modeled very well. As I said, the feedback of increase to CO2 to o H2O to temperature is not real. There's a feedback claim that they make. If you just went by CO2 alone, how much could it increase the temperature of Earth? One degree centigrade. And that, my friends, would make life better. I want to get into how CO2 contributes to Earth. This is going to be interesting for many of you. And some of you have seen this before. So in the left-hand side, there's four trees that were grown in different CO2 environments. The leftmost one is about where we are today. It's 385 parts per million. So it's, it's getting started. It's, you know, it's making its way. It's a slow growth curve. And then you make your way all the way over to 835 parts per million. What do you see? You see twice the, the height. When you pass by a closed-in greenhouse, when you're driving around, you're driving through Utah, you're driving through California, and you pass by a, a greenhouse that's closed in, the one thing you can count on is that the CO2 inside is at least 1,200 parts per million because it increases the growth rate significantly. You can grow crops in a fraction of the time. Now, we've got satellites now. So we can actually look across the world and you can see the dark green, if you can see the dark green, the dark green, the greener sections is what's happened in the last three decades. CO2 increased from 280 parts per million to 420 parts per million has caused the, the uh, growth rate to increase. And we've increased the size of green areas in the world as a result of that, get this, by the size of, of the continental U.S. Continental U.S. And it's really interesting because the, the growth rate it seems to be very enhanced, maybe for obvious reasons, around deserts like the Sahara Desert. You see more plant growth around the Sahara Desert. You don't read that in New York Times. And so this is something that I'm, I'm going to touch on only a couple of these parameters. But CO2, carbon has what's called a cycle. And the cycle, if you could see it, is this gray curve around the outside. So every CO2 molecule, and when you breathe out, you're taking carbon with oxygen and making CO2. And you're getting energy from it. It's not only providing you, you know, uh, use the use of oxygen, but you're also getting energy from that process. And you're providing plant food, as, as we said. But this, this indicates, if you, could, if you could read it, and I'm going to go through this very quickly, but there's a lot of details here. What the details are is that the ocean has most of the CO2. 95 or 85, something like 90% of all CO2 is in limestone, which is in the ocean. And, and in parts where they mine 
to create the material used in making concrete. Concrete is captured CO2. But here's, here's the interesting part of the story. The, the CO2 that makes this loop never stops traveling. So the CO2 that you see outside could have resulted from burning of a, a pharaoh's house so many years ago. And it was consumed by a plant, and then this happened, and that happened, and here we are. So, you know, the, 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 um, the areas of, of uh, interest are going to be what man does. And what's very interesting to show you that, that none of this is understood. None of this is understood well enough to be making the predictions they're making because what ends up happening is that there's 90, you can't read it, but I'll read it for you. Coming out of the ocean, there's 92 gigatons of CO2 being released into the atmosphere. And there's 90 being captured somewhere in the ocean. Now, the capturing process occurs in cold weather, if I have that correct. And the warm weather brings more out. As you can see, it, it warm in the temperature and the CO2 increases. So I am correct about that. So, you know, you don't, no one's done the study, definitive study to show and prove what these things are. How much from the trees? How much from agriculture? You know, what, what's going on in, in that regard? And, and no one can give you a study that confirms all this. They make claims, but they don't, they don't have the science. Okay, so this is, this is the fabulous final exam of optical spectrum. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the entire spectrum. We're seeing on the left-hand side, you can see that there's incoming, that's from the sun. And on the right-hand side, you see the outgoing uh, spectrum. So they're combining the two spectrum together. And what they're showing you is that there's a window here through the atmosphere. So you could drive your CO2 through that window and get to outer space. But what it also more importantly shows you is that the total absorption uh, in the scattering is consuming a great deal of that spectrum. And the most important message is look at the water vapor. The water vapor overlaps the, the carbon dioxide absorption. It actually kills kills the the um, you know the other greenhouse gases. So water vapor beats up on the other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. That's what that's saying. So what you're getting is you're when people say, well, nitric oxide, that's the latest problem we've got. We've got a real problem here. Go, have you seen the spectrum? Do you understand what this means? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So that's, that's you know, that's uh, basically. Now, this is, this is a, great, a, a great lower left curve. You know, when Al Gore was born, there were 7,000 of us, polar bears. Polar bears have been used a lot to gain emotional sympathy for, for climate alarmism. And today, there's only 30,000 remaining. I'm sorry. And why are 30,000 remaining? Because they changed the hunting laws. That's all it took. And, but that doesn't stop, that doesn't stop the people wanting to make claims. Because over here, you can see the dark curve is what the so-called alarmists were predicting. And the sharp red curve is what was observed by a scientist who went out and, and, and actually looked and didn't stay in New York. Okay, so this is this is again the quality of, of pseudoscience, and and this this shows you something else that that you can take uh, and make use of in when you can see it, and it basically says here is the emissions, annual emissions from the United States, and if you look at that carefully, you'll see that the emissions peak and they're going down. The economy is booming. We've increased GDP. We've we've you know we've gotten cars. We've gotten sold more pickup trucks. You know, I don't know if Rick has a pickup truck, but he, you know, who knows? But you know what's ended up happening is that we convert a lot of our energy to natural gas, and that has a lower amount percentage of CO two. 
And what's interesting on the right-hand side is what we're dealing with now in international politics, big time. And what you see here is the green curve is the United States. And you'll notice that the United States is the only one that's been measuring it fairly accurately. But the, but the curve went up. And again, you see the natural gas and efficiencies of cars, miles per hour, miles per gallon, and buildings are built you know, better on, because we're conscious of the environment. We don't want to spend too much money on energy and so on and so forth. But you'll see that, that the only major country, the only major country, and I don't call Russia a major country, and, and in this period of time they're not, but, but the one that you can say is the yellow curve is China. And now China is emitting over twice the amount of CO2 that we are. If What time is it, hon? Okay. Um, and so you, you've got, if you add India to that, then, then India plus China are guaranteed to basically be two to three X a good part of Europe or United States. So I ask you this, and you can ask your representative this every chance you get. Why are we not asking, if we're asking the people of America to shut off all fossil fuels, which means all the clothes you are wearing now have to go. Those are made with fossil fuels. The carpeting goes. You know, a lot of this, no lights, we have to run by candlelight. So we have to go to that level, and that's zero, that's what it means. So we have to go to that level because China can't be bothered. We can't pressure China to reduce, you know, their, their emissions. And no one is doing that. They're very smart about, about leveraging what, they, what value they do provide to the, to the United States. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give you the conclusions. I'm going to walk you through these, and then I'm, I'm going to probably just touch on a couple more slides, and then we're going to go to Q&A. So what have we done? What have I, what have I accomplished tonight? And, and again, I suggest you get a copy of the slideshow. Uh, you know, we can, we can meet again to have questions and do more Q&A, and why did you say this, and why did you say that? What about this curve I saw last week? So you can do all that. Because I think it's very important to not brush past this. And I haven't told you what to think. I've only asked you to think. So you get to continue thinking. And before we, before we wrap it up, just <laughs> let me... So it's not possible to have the data fit the declarations in, on CO2. The models do look shaky at best. Uh, CO2 does not drive temperature. It's the other way around. CO2 is not a pollutant, but the gas of life. It is the gas of life. You go below 150 parts per million in CO2, the plants die, we die. The next ice age, that's going to happen because that's when it happens. And so what we have is there's a lot to discover and understand about climate. Climate history is not in favor of alarmism. If you look at these curves, you go, yeah, there's been a lot of CO2 peaks. There's been a lot of temperature peaks. It's interesting because really when you look at all these, these trends that are taken, they're not taken very, very often, but when they're done, uh, they often take the lowest point in temperature to show the maximum effect of CO2. I saw that in a Tesla ad. Oh, it's the only thing that can describe what we're seeing in terms of temperature increase. And so it's selective trending. If you go back, if you go back in time, you'll see that there was a global cooling period from 1940 to 1970. They always leave that part out because 1940 is the peak temperature in this last 100 years. And I can show that to you in another time. Oh, let's see. That's... Um, oh, hang on. Got to go back. And energy policies are far-reaching and being based on alarmism. They're not being based on science. That, that's the ultimate thing. And you can, you can test people. Is the science settled? And you say no. And then the next question you ask them is, when's the debate? No debates. No presentations. No questions. Science is settled. I got canceled at, at, on Stanford twice as a result of that. 
So I want to I want to touch on one thing in this curve, and it's really messy for for this resolution. But you know, here's China, here's the United States out in our current time period, and this is the emissions in in uh, in tons. And so you'll see up here, little old Africa, little old suffering Africa. 1.2 billion people growing to 1.8 billion in Africa. They're sitting on massive amounts of natural gas, massive amounts. They've gone to the World Bank and said, lend us money for a low cost electric power plant. Can't do it. You're gonna to emit too much CO2. And if you look at that, you'll see that the emissions for Africa hasn't changed for the last you know, this goes back to 1950. So for about the last 60 years, Africa has not increased their emissions. So um, when we're talking about race relations and we're talking about racial sensitivities, pull out this curve and say, what's wrong with your racial considerations? Okay. And a couple more. This is the ice. The ice is, is not melting. Arctic tends to melt. And usually what happens is the Antarctic increases in size of ice. They'll always show Greenland that there's something caving on the eastern side, but they don't show the fact that the western side is actually increasing in size of ice. They didn't tell you in the New York Times or the San Jose Mark that the temperature in Antarctica set an all-time record in the last couple of months. All-time low record onward and over and over again. So one of the interesting things here, and this is, this is the picture taken of the sun, and you'll notice that in this particular uh, area, there's some dark spots. You can probably see that even in the last row. Well, those dark spots are what are called sunspots for obvious reasons. And what they are is they're hot spots. And what are hot spots? They're spots where the fuel has been sucked out of the center of the circle to be burned at the edges because it's super hot. And there's a magnetic field associated with it and there's a lot of physics. The sun is a fantastic physics project and, and most of the people that are alarmists have no idea how it operates. But the interesting thing is that uh, our friend Willie Soon went off with a bunch of people and they took a look at, with big data and AI, they took a look at what could we do with big data and AI? Can we, can we look, because we have a lot of actuals, it goes back about 100 years, can we take the actuals of sunspots, however accurate they might be, and they're generally pretty accurate, can we take that data, can we build a model based on AI and, and big data, and then can we predict using the model the last 15 years. Can we do that accurately? And they proved to themselves they could. And so what they're, what they're doing now is they're running that model forward in time and they're saying, what's up ahead? Good thing to, you know, it's the first thing you'd want to do, right? Let's run the model. We predicted the past accurately, it, you know, and without using the data of the last 15 years, they predicted those 15 years pretty accurately. And, and, uh, and so they took a look at the next couple of decades. And if this is true, then we're headed towards a sunspot minimum. And what that means is we're going into a cool period. Don't throw out your fleece. We're going to go into a cool period. So this is possible. It's not a for sure. It's not, you know, some law we need to write or anything. But isn't that interesting that we have science that shows with good science technique and let's and Willie always starts, he always starts his talk by saying, if anybody can prove me wrong, please step forward. I want to talk to them. He's, he's doing the Einstein. And, and this is, I wanted to show you this, this curve. The one on the right is the number of billions of dollars. It's $2 billion being fed into agency after agency after alarmist group, after institutions and studies and so on. And the, you know, and of course, on the lower part, the taxpayer funds go through the building of climate change agenda and right into the Democratic Party. And I'm afraid that's true. I'm sorry to say that's true. 
And if someone comes forth and they say, I've got a great proposal, a grant proposal, I really want you to take a serious look at it, the horse takes him for a ride because he's a skeptic. And I think I've, you know, this is Richard Feynman is always good for a, a quote. This is near the end, so bear with me. It doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It could be a beautiful theory. And New York Times does a lot of gra good graphics. So they make theories look really beautiful. Doesn't make how beautiful a theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. And all, tra all truth passes through three stages. This is, a, again, a quote I couldn't, couldn't refuse. And you can, maybe you can read it. The first stage is it's ridicule. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. The second phase is violently opposed. You are really messing with the planet here. You're a denier. And the third, the third stage is it's accepted and taken as self-evident and always been self-evident. And you can see that in, in lockdowns and quotes and going on in today's news. And I think we're getting, yeah, I think the acknowledgements, you guys are all acknowledged. I put all your names in here, you can't read them. But soon, and a lot of scientists were behind the data that I used. And they taught me a lot. I have to say, I learned a lot from many famous scientists in their own realm. And they're never on the news. And I thank Sandy for inviting me to come here and, and Neil for helping with it, taping my mouth shut. And I think that's, that's it. I've got other supplemental slides, but I think we're done. Are we, are we okay on time? So I'm, I'm asking you to think, but I'm also asking you to consider what do you want to do with this information? Okay, so we're going to start with some questions here. Yeah. Um, actually, if we can get the lights on. So yeah, please don't ask the question without the microphone because uh, we have yeah, people online who want to hear. So we'll start with, <laughs> with Jared, <laughs> who's right up here. Here we go. So I find your presentation very interesting for a simple fact that when I was in grade school, <laughs> I was taken on a field trip where they showed us a video from Leonard Nimoy about the in search oh. of the coming ice age. <laughs> and then, and yeah. then they took us to a greenhouse put on by the university of Arizona. It's right next to the, um, the airport there. And in that airport, they were talking about, or in that greenhouse, they were talking about how they were, they were increasing the CO2 in the greenhouse because they were going to need that for, for, greenhouses to grow food because in the future it was yeah. gonna, earth was going to be too cold to grow things outside so <laughs> and it was really cool i mean there was like massive onions i mean there was these huge yeah. bananas yeah. I, like i was going holy cow this is amazing now you flip and it's like 30 years later and it's like 180 degrees how, how does a flip like that happen when there's people oops when there's people that were part of this science all along, especially in agriculture, how do you have that kind of flip and people still have intellectual honesty about it? Well, I, they don't. But what, they're, what you have to answer your question is you have to look at where the money flows. Where does the power and money flow? And you know, when you, when you uh, look at climate, have you seen a presentation like this before? No. No. The answer is no. So a lot of people are being quieted, intimidated, and so on. I've mentioned Willie Soon a number of times. He was actually accused by the New York Times of taking money from the oil companies and being corrupt. Actually, the, the Smithsonian Institute took the money from the, from the oil companies, took a big chunk of the money, and paid him the salary to do his research. Paid him, he didn't request this, paid, paid his salary to the tune of a McDonald's supervisor on an annual basis. So this is the kind of, so you look at, you look at uh, what's happening, there's something called the COP27 coming up. And it's climate something something. But I always remember it, the first time I heard it, just, it was, what do the initials stand for? And the initial stands for clowns on parade. And they all over the world. And you go to these meetings that are talking about 
all the alarmist latest news and graphs and you got to be concerned because your N2O is getting bigger in Sweden and whoa, send me some money. You know, so that's that's kind of what happens. But it really comes down to the idea that, you know, you, you've got to really follow the money and the money is huge. This is the one I showed you, two billion. I, you know, I think that the people who are alarmist don't get funded unless they're alarmist. So they get, you know, the, the number of billions of, a year. You just saw the, the inflation thing that was 600 million or 600 billion for climate policy. So, I mean, this is what I showed you. Two billion is a small number to compare what's being done now. So you have billions up here and the skeptics get thousands down here. So we have a question online um, from Matthew. He asked a question about the collision of the carbon dioxide with the photon and the nitrogen. So it says, well, once it once nitrogen releases, it won't it connect, won't it collide with another carbon dioxide? And then how long? And then the question is, does any of that energy get retained and how long between each collision? No, I think that that you know the gas law, if, if you if you go up into the atmosphere, it cools. You all know that you can't step outside the, you know, the main uh, plane that you're on because it's like whatever, minus 10 degrees centigrade or something. So you know that as, as, as the gas rises from Earth, it really loses its kinetic energy and then cools. And so really what ends up happening is the gas law and the physics of, and the dynamics of collisions take over. But it isn't like you have a special safe where CO2 takes all the energy and puts it in the safe. Well, if they put it in the safe, guess what? It wouldn't be warming Earth either, would it? So, you know, it basically the collisions dominate up to a certain level, and then the collisions start falling off in frequency. And then eventually, because you're getting, you're getting radiation in from the sun, how do you balance the equation? You get so much in, you have to get so much out. Otherwise, something changes. You either cool the planet, or you heat the planet. And to get that energy out, it has to radiate. So that's the beauty of the dynamics in what's called the stratosphere, is that CO2, the more CO2 that you have in the stratosphere, there's an incremental cooling of the stratosphere because the stratosphere climbs in temperature as you get up in the stratosphere because it's very not, not very well populated. So the, the bottom line is collisions, normal dynamic physics, gas physics applies. Okay, other questions? Raise your hand and I'll come right here. Thank you for giving a presentation. You started out talking about the World Economic Forum. They have a certain population control limiter agenda. And then you're closing out about the, how much excess carbon is being emitted through communist China and uh, also increasing the, the future trend in India. Both of these countries, they've in the past couple of decades, they've had a lot of a lot of abortions. Is that one of the reasons why that they might not be so targeted on the anti-emissions policies? Well, I can, I can uh, no, they're 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 trying to catch up with you. China is obviously trying to catch up and surpass the United States. We all know that. But let, let's take a look at the bigger question, and I'll answer a couple of questions in the process. If if you look at what the planet could support. If you say the planet can support what population? What, what's the number of people that the planet could support? With the diet, the calorie diet of the United States per capita. You think, oh, Terry, you know, too many McDonald's. I'm sorry. It, it, no, think of, it, think of it in terms of carbohydrates and fruits and veggies and all that kind of happy stuff. So you, you, you can populate the world. And what's happening in the world is that Kids are either hands in the field, which they are still in a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of countries, or they're luxury goods. And I see a few luxury goods in the audience. <laughs> so, you know, kids are not, are going to benefit by more attention from parents. I see, you know, a lot of families that have very large families and they may have a certain faith and so on and so forth. That's fine. But if you look at the total population that this, this, the, the predictions are somewhere around 9 billion people. And so you get up to 9 billion. Can you feed them? Or are they going to be starving to death? You know, the, 
what was the uh, the theory back in the fifties that you know the yeah the Paul Ehrlich and you know the food supply increases linearly and population increases exponentially. Wrong. Why? Because people who make these predictions do not take into consideration the ingenuity of mankind. And so what ended up happening, and we had a chance to meet Norman Borlaug before he died. And, and so he was a tall man, and he was feeding the world. He, he went out and affected the carbohydrate production per acre by 5x in major countries around the world. Major countries around the world. And he said, we can feed the world's population at the, at the value. He thought it was like 10, but I think it's below that. Um, UN does make these predictions, but, you know, uh, maybe the only one they do accurately, but nevertheless. And, and so you, you, look at, you look at that and you say, okay, so how is, that, how is that done? You don't have to use GMO foods. You can if you want to. You can really blow the doors off. Uh, the output per acre, but you don't have to really even, uh, you know, do something as expanding greatly agricultural area. He says you just use some of the theories that he's come up with, some of the science and innovation in agriculture. There's still a lot of innovation to be had. So you can have a much bigger population and you can feed them well and you can ask them to innovate and solve many of the world's problems. What are we doing when we're spending all this money on CO2 fear tactics? We're not solving environmental problems. We're not innovating. We're not debating and getting to the real science. And that's going to cost us badly in the rest of my life. Thankfully, it didn't come sooner or it would have cost me my life. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. So we know that localized weather change is possible. But um, is there a such thing, geoengineering, that changes big scale of climate, like, um, you know, intensify a tornado, or I heard Bill Gates want to block the sun? <laughs> yeah, Bill, Bill, I'll start with Bill Gates first. The guy's, the guy's really, uh, anything that has dollars associated with it, he seems to love right now. Or, you know, uh, an ID tag, or, you know, any number of things. Um, yeah, so I think that what what he thought was a really novel idea, and it's not novel in any time in the last 30, 40 years, is to put uh, sulfur particles up into the, any sort of particles up into the atmosphere. And aerosols do block the sun. They reflect the sun, so they will cool. Volcanoes, when they erupt, cool the Earth's surface. Not for long, and you don't want them to keep erupting. But they do put out, you know, a lot of particulate. So aerosols are one of the fact natural factors. I didn't bring it in, but one of the natural factors to affect climate. So what's what's the first part of your question is about temperature and weather and climate? Well, I think it might be something to consider once we know what the hell's going on with the climate. And I'm I'm here with a lot of people that said. We don't even know how to model how to make good models of the future. We could have one degree centigrade increase by the end of the century, and that'll work very much in our favor. Instead of the six and eight, and you know, it keeps going up, and then they bring it back down again, and then it keeps going back up again. It's comical when you see these when you see these claims. But I think you know the 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 geoengineering is you're going to put something into. Um, you're going to put something into the atmosphere and you're not sure exactly what's going to happen when you do. Because whatever you put in the atmosphere, remember, it's mixed. It's like when you put something in a mixer and you push that button, you're putting everything together and it's coming out very homogeneous. So you're going to put something into the atmosphere, but you can't take it out. You can check in, but you can't check out. It's Hotel California. It is a Hotel California. It's we, okay, other question. Let, let me take one. Okay, let me take one more from Matthew here. He says, um, "Isn't uh, the CO two being absorbed by the oceans, and it's making it more acidic? Oh, uh, and isn't there a point where at which it cannot absorb any more?" The answer is no, and no. <laughs> and and the basic reason why is that where is the major portion of CO two today? 
where is 80 plus percent of the CO2 plants? It's in the oceans, baby. So, you know, what ends up happening is that you can have acidic water coming from a fresh river, but then it gets into the ocean and there's a natural buffering by the, I've forgotten the molecular name of it, but it's calcium, carbonate, et cetera. And, you know, what ends up happening when you put more CO2 in is that the, the little shrimp and the lobsters, you can see a shrimp on this, and they've done these experiments, shrimp on low CO2, shrimp or a lobster, a, a, a shellfish, and then you put it on high CO2, it's bigger and the skin is thicker. There's no acid there. Bigger you're not, shell. You're not killing the lobster. You're not even cooking the lobster. This is a bad deal. So, no, I think, you know, the acidification, I, I would uh, tell Matthew to go off and look at uh, Patrick Moore and some of his material on, on what's happening too. And acidification, or if any of you want to really immerse yourself in more data than you can possibly imagine, and, and you're stuck with, uh, you know, the in-laws over Thanksgiving, you say, well, I've got an important thing to read. Go, go to what's called What's Up With That? and put in a search and you put in acidification and you'll get back a long list of articles to read. And, but the bottom line is this, the ocean buffers itself. It buffers itself. I believe that's spelled W-A-T-T, -T, right? What's up? It's, yeah, I, I think it is yeah. W, yeah, something. Like I think what? you can do a yeah. search and I think of it as W-U-W, -W, what's oh. up with that, but that's not the web, website. You can put in W-U-W-T and then you'll get to the web address. Since the polar ice caps aren't melting, is there any credence to these claims that there's been increased uh, shipping traffic in the Arctic? And like, you know, longer duration for, you know, uh, shipping traffic to occur? No, it's interesting because, you know, you could, you could say that we've heard a lot about Russian misinformation. And I always love the term disinformation, misinformation, because whatever follows after it is wrong. If they say, well, you know, this guy is saying this. No, you're saying that. You know, it's it's really kind of comical. But I think the the uh, polar ice caps, if you look back over the entire period of time and you saw those curves that I presented that showed the temperature curve being up here and then dropping down to normal times where we are now, we're dropping down into an ice, ice age. We're in what's called an interglacial period. So it's a warming period inside an ice age. We're in an ice age, but we're in a warming period inside that ice age. Um, you know, what, what ends up happening is that you can look at the, the Arctic and the best information is coming from the Russians. Russians in Denmark, and then you can look at Antarctic uh, and that's coming from the satellites. And, you know, they basically show you, I went through that slide very, very quickly, but it showed the total amount of ice and the ice is kind of cooking along and all the, you know, all the, all the uh, bad articles about the ice falling and everything's caving in and the shipping. Normally the Arctic uh, is, I don't know what the percentage of time is, but it's often without ice. In fact, they call it a polar ice age because there's ice on the polar caps. And you didn't see it, but, and I didn't have a chance to go through it, but the sea level changes from 20 meters to minus, 200 meters. 20 meters, Frank Gore is right. But he's going to have to wait a long time for that. And that's when the ice melts. 250 meters down, below where it is today, is, is uh, and you'll see this in my written PDF version if you want to read it. Uh, it basically says that you're freezing the planet and you're consuming all the CO2. And you can maybe grow something in Greenland for a little while, but good luck, because the CO2 is going to ramp down past 150, and we say adieu, you know, so that's about it. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd like to, I think I'm missing some of the insights that you're sharing in the energy spectrum graph. Okay. Would you mind um, putting one of them back up? Maybe the 1D modeling one, or e either one would be fine, or whichever you think would lend to more insight? I think that probably the best one is the 1D modeling. Okay. We'll get back to that in a second. 
eventually. Sorry, I can't go any faster, but. And it's coming back up in the section before that, I think. I think I'm going the right direction. There. Okay. So this is measuring it. The X, I can't read it very well, but the X axis is the wavelength. Come on up here and I'll. Or, or frequency. I'll... Right. The X axis is wavelength or. or it's one over wavelength. One, one over wavelength. So it's frequency? Yeah, they put frequency. I don't know why they use that. It's kind of sloppy, I think. Okay. But... And then on the Y axis is energy. That's the watts per square meter. Yeah. Watts per square meter. Okay. And the, and so you have energy coming in from the sun, which yeah. has a particular spectrum. And then yeah. you have energy that's either reflected back or energy that's absorbed. What, which, which is the net energy that's actually being it, absorbed? It's, it's actually, yeah, that, this is the, this is the hard part to explain in a okay. short pro, in a short talk like this. This is the, this is uh, the 1D modeling of, energy going out from the Earth's surface. It's okay. actually only the radiated energy at the top of the atmosphere. I want to be very clear about that. Okay. And 1D modeling means that they're not taking all these collisions and different energy flows. And, you know, a lot of what I showed you is on a clear sky, so it has no clouds in the sky. Right. So what's the difference between clouds in the sky and not? I, I didn't show that to you. But this shows you uh, if you can see it now, since you're close, it can show you, you know, what at at uh, you know what is really the, the low frequency. So this is this is the infrared region, and you can see how H2O is dominant in in what's happening there. But it what it says is that at the Earth's surface, which is well below where this would have been taken if it was a measurement, it's not a measurement. It's a quantum mechanical derived you know, piece of insight. And I can give you the 59 page paper and I challenge you to read it. Okay. It's, it's pretty, pretty detailed. So, so the notch, the notch that represents in that frequency range, that means there's less energy being absorbed into the planet or there's, that's more reflected back. No, it means that the energy that was in that, the energy that came in. Okay. At that frequency, right. The, at is that the level. blue line. Right. That you can say that's right at the earth's surface. Okay. And that's the hard part of some of these curves. I think I showed you one curve where there was the top of the atmosphere and then the sun coming in on the bottom of the atmosphere, right. in, in, in Earth's surface. And so it does take some, some time to reflect and, as you're doing. So, you know, what, what ended up happening here is that the CO2 captured energy. It doesn't tell you where it went. I see. But what it tells you is that you see this curve, there's an implicit curve that's right here. I see. And that curve is the radiation curve for a much lower temperature than the Earth's surface. So what that's saying is that the Earth's surface radiates out mm -hmm. and some of that stuff gets caught by CO2. Only 8% of it gets caught right. by CO2. And then what ends up happening? The N2 and O2 redistributed in your neighborhood. So, you know, we get the energy back in a different location. So if, if you're doing this at the top of the atmosphere, then you have to be clear that the energy is finding another path. Okay. The Earth is extremely good at getting rid of energy. Okay. Hurricanes are a way for the Earth to get rid of energy. It's sucking tremendous amounts of energy and water vapor right. up into this vortex and it's distributing it far and wide. Sure. And there's only some conditions where that can be can occur. And by the way, the you know the UN and, and IPCC and who makes all these predictions and every New York Times, all these people are making these predictions. You say, well, do you have any science that backs up that CO2 affects hurricanes? I didn't show you, but there's some good trends that show it doesn't really do anything with the trends. And they they were saying there's no science that says CO2 affects the trend of a hurricane. It doesn't happen. There's no science behind it. And by the way, if you get a if you get conditions on the West Coast, mm -hmm. again, a, a, you know, you can blow your friends away with this. You get conditions on the West Coast that are, you know, warm air uh, kind of coming in winds going to the East Coast, where the hurricanes, at least in this region of the Atlantic, occur. It can blow the top off a hurricane 
and it stops being a hurricane. There's like 70 tropical storms a day that are created. So they have to build, and if they build with the right temperature conditions and water, and, and they don't get blown away by the West Coast. So it's actually in our power in California to take care of the hurricanes. Okay. All right, I'm gonna, let me ask this one. So I'm, I'm still not quite seeing it, if this, okay. this may or may not help. So the total energy would be the integral, some total energy would be the integral under that curve, right? Or the, the and so what is the, so the total energy of the blue line, right? That's the total energy that's coming in on let's, the surface. Let's come back, I wanna, okay. I wanna oh, that, that was the curve right there. Okay, so this is three different regions on the mm -hmm. right. The same basic curve, you know, I could walk you through. And what it shows you is at the top, there's temperatures in the Sahara that are much higher than what are shown here in the Mediterranean. Okay. Makes sense. But this, one's the, this one is the curious one. That one says that CO2 is cooling the ice caps. Look at this curve, now that we have a little more time to spend on it. This is the net short wave in, so that's coming from the sun. And this is, this is the latitude so you're talking about, that's got to be the south, probably, I don't, I'm a latitude a dummy. And, and this, is, this is the north. Yeah, it says north and south. Great. And, and you can see that the energy that's actually long wave out is occurring on the caps. It's more than what's occurring right. in, the, in the tropics. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, so see. if you think, yeah, yeah, yeah. what you're trying to do is you're right. trying to make it a one-dimensional problem. So right, right, I'm going right. yeah, 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 to give you an example. Yeah, yeah. You've got this ball mm -hmm. that's spinning at a thousand right, miles right, an hour right, right and you shine a flashlight on yeah. it called the sun yeah and it heats a spot right well where's that spot go yeah it's got almost like 24 hours right to come back around and lose all that energy right so you don't have to absorb and release mm -hmm. and be in balance and integrate and see that it's all mm -hmm. and you don't get this anywhere none of this is yeah. taught in in any grade through college, I can guarantee you right now. Anybody that shows me this, I'll give them twenty bucks. If it's <laughs> if it's if it's being taught, it isn't being taught. It's the opposite is being taught. Great. All right. Thanks. Yeah. I just want to comment. You offered people twenty bucks if they refute you. Steve Kirsch has offered two million if they refute know, him on vaccines, and nobody's I, taking him up on that I know, one. So I know. I <laughs> a question he's, back he's, there. He's worth a lot more money than I am. <laughs> I know. I'm just showing you that. Nobody's going to take us up on any of these. If they won't take up a $2 million offer. All right. Hey, so I want to dovetail on uh, the gentleman. And uh, I, want to, I want to say, is, our, our, is there a rising tide of uh, professors that are wanting to teach this? And if they do, are they persona non grata? Are they going to get fired? Or are they going to get rep reprimanded for teaching this in schools? I mean, do you see a rising tide? No pun intended. I think, I think that, that um, there's a yes and no answer to that. And I think that really when you say the rising tide requires what? It requires that students and professors teach their students. Now, if you look at the number of people, Will Happer's over 80. He's a professor emeritus at, at Princeton. Brilliant guy. Richard Lenzen, Nobel Prize winner. Brilliant guy. He's probably close to 80. So you get the picture. We've got a problem with the backfill. We don't. We can have first round draft choices, but we can't draft anybody. So that's that's the negative. But the positive is that people are getting tired. You know, do you want to lie to people? I mean, it, it is a form of a lie, and you can convince yourself otherwise. I mean, I was at Stanford for one presentation by a Stanford prof in climate. Carolyn and I were there. Mike was there, actually, and very, very interestingly. We had about five people there, and we really caught their attention. And so he got up, this guy, Professor Diffenbaugh, and you'll see him on the news occasionally. And he presents this curve, and it, it shows that the CO2 is driving temperature, and that we're getting the hottest ever temperatures right now. And I just, I sat there and I shook my head. And he, it's a small enough group. He said, well, what, what's your question? I said, you're using the wrong data set. And he just kept talking about something else. Right. So, you know, it, it's, I think that people, you have to say that, you know, when this, there, there's several things that I'm predicting right now will happen, and I could be absolutely wrong. That, you know, we all know that these things are 10, 10 years away from destruction. We have, you know, we have all these vectors and intersectionality and, and the big reset, and all these things are like 10, 20 years away. And what does that mean exactly? 
it means that when we get there and nothing has happened, you know, if, if nothing, if there isn't any great control and any even bigger lies that talk about, you know, that CO2, we were just kidding, you know, it's really CO2 plus this other thing in this condition, which is what you normally get. But, you know, I think, I think that, um, you know, the, the idea is that the people are going to see that renewables are impossible. They're a good solution for where they fit. But when did you, when did you and I experience, all of us experience anything in the marketplace of ideas and uh, of innovation that said, you know what? I think we ought to put this in instead of silicon in our chips. What do you think? Oh yeah, that's all, thank you, that's a great idea. So you start at the top, you get crap at the bottom and you kill the economy. Do people really wanna kill this economy? Do you think that's gonna last? Well, we'll find out in a few weeks. Yeah. But you know, I think, I think that you know, ultimately, it's the truth is self-evident. We understand. We we really believed it all along. So you'll see a lot of true believers. But right now, we're in a cancel culture. Right. It seems like a cabal just to promote an agenda. Obviously, you know, to uh, you know, depopulation, uh, get us to eat fake meat and all that. Well, if you can control like the saying. energy, what if you can control the energy? What do you control? You control the economy, and if you control the economy. You control the people. Uh, gee, I don't know. What's the goal here? Feudalism. <laughs> I, I was just going to have a quick note. There's actually a company called Skycool that's actually using this process to do um, oh. radiative cooling of homes and businesses where they basically put uh, radiators on the roof and they're emitting it, the energy out to space uh, yeah. rather than you know air, air exchange. It's called a and heat it, pump, really, isn't it? Yeah, it's 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 a heat pump, but it's just directing the heat out into space. Yeah, it's a well. They have a whole. It's like an HVAC system, so it's called like one of them is called Skycool, and they are basically taking advantage of this to cool homes. No, I mean you see a lot of people. It's interesting. I've been spending a lot of time chasing through a lot of material on electric vehicles because I'm on a project now that I'm going to resume now that I'm off of this, and so assuming you guys don't really suck me into too much, and I'm I'm hopeful we will get back together and some percentage of you will start this discussion. I can go on into what proclamations have been made. The, the last 72 proclamations that have been made, the last 72, 59 have timed out, meaning that they reached the time, put up or shut up. The, the score right now is 59 to zero. <laughs> is anybody gonna pay attention to that? I, you know, I will. Willie soon or generate the data has. So I, I think you know it's 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 incredibly interesting when you look at what what things are happening in the world. But it's very much chaos right now. How are we doing on time? We are at nine thirty. Uh, there's still a lot of questions. We, you know, if you need to leave, but I know there seems to be a lot of questions. I hate to. I'm, I'm still I hate here. to stop any any questions here. Rick's got his eyes open, so I'm still here. <laughs> Um, I just have a question in regards to um, how do you, how do um, these governments use this information to call the population into mass migration or these other populations in other countries to believing that they need to give and leave everything they've ever worked for and owned in some of these countries, which is quite quite good for themselves, even if it may not be at a um, luxury level. Um, but to leave all they have, their families and so on, that's the first question. And the second question is um, in regards to um, individuals um the 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 um, brainwashing so to speak starts you know so young now in like nine and ten year olds and um, before that actually it, it, and that's when um you know my kids started getting hit that in school yeah. so what do we do about that as well yeah i think i think you have to you know the, the age-old parenting and and exposing them to ideas and asking them lots of questions if they come home with a proclamation say what are, the, what are the things that would back up that proclamation? So get them to think about it, you know, even at a young age. They may not come back for a couple of years, but when they do, they're going to say, Mom, you know, thanks for helping me think about that. But, you know, I think the other part of your question, because I'm running out a little bit of, on, out of gas as well, but, um, was the, the culling of the population. Yeah, you can see, actually, you can see in 
what really concerned me, and this came out of a conference I was at recently, uh, Finland is reducing its agricultural number of agricultural farms because of the nitric oxide and because of the population. And so, you know, it's just being, being an activist like Mike, for instance, being an activist and asking them questions they can't, you know, on the school board. Uh, there has to be some science teacher conference. And we need to, you know, I think that the people that are fighting for science are assuming that science can protect itself, and it can't. MIT, if anybody here knows what a DEI agent administrator is, um, it, MIT went from zero administrators to 100 within the last year. And they're going woke. They've gone woke. And DEI I, is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Nobody can, nobody can define equity. <laughs> nobody can it's define equity. It's even DIE, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really DIE, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's, 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 you know, the fact of the matter is if, if people have not asked the questions, and if they're not allowed to ask the questions, they have a several choices. They either fight for their freedom to speak or they leave the country. By the way, we... And um, where do they go is the real question, right? <laughs> I don't... No, by the way, I I will, we'll get Angela's question next. But I just wanted to make this announcement. So um, as most of you know, I am also the founder of a group called Every Black Life Matters, which is the response to BLM. And uh, we actually came up with a program for any company that needs a DI officer, we will be your DEI officers. <laughs> you just pay us a small stipend, we'll come in, we will check you, and we will give you the black blessing from the black, because it's a black-led group. Uh, you know, it's uh, co-sponsored by the Frederick Douglass Foundation. They're not co-sponsored, but they were one of our founders. So, yeah, so con contact That's us. Great. And tomorrow we're doing a talk on social justice versus true justice. I am at least, not tomorrow, on Tuesday, at the um, Santa Cruz Women's Federated uh, Republican, Santa Cruz Women's Republican Federation down in Santa Cruz. If you're, you'll get an email, I'll send it out tonight. Uh, and if you're not on the mailing list, please get, uh, most of you are, I think, but if you're not, go to signup.noblindfaith.com, signup.noblindfaith.com. But I also, uh, this is actually a good time. Uh, if they want to get hold of you, uh, do you, I don't know if you can give out an email, but yeah, they I can, can give out an email. Okay. So I didn't want to do it streaming. I don't know if we're still streaming. John. Yeah, we are, but you could do it at the end. Um, or yeah. I, on the streaming line, I just said, send yeah, us an email and we'll send it to you. I, I don't but think I, I, at the end of this, we'll, uh, we'll get you or actually, or send me an email to GW for global warming at no blind If you send yeah, it to them, then can, we'll forward get emails to, to you. Yeah. I don't so, want and to then we'll get you. We'll get you on their mailing list, and then you can contact them. So if you yeah. want to get out yeah. con contact uh, yeah. Terry, please. I can I can send GW you a copy of no Yeah, I can send you the PDF, which explains some of the stuff I talked about. I'm going to be working on that this week, and it ha has more material. It's got about another hour long presentation. So, okay, in it. Angela. And oh, we did have one question, uh, another question online, but let's go with that after. Okay. Angela. I was wondering. Um, when they show the temperature information over a historic time period, if where is that being measured? And if there's historic data on the temperature of the ocean and how that would compare to wherever they're measuring the global temperature? Yeah, I don't, I don't know about the last one. I think, I think this one, if I can get back to it. No, I can't. It's further forward. I'll make one more shot at it and see. Yeah, there we go. Here we go. Um, so this is one of several. And I don't know about whether the history of, you know, in ocean, because what they're doing is they're taking ice core samples. So if it's the ocean, by definition, there's no ice to measure. And so everything is mixing. So the ice, what the ice core gives you is they go down. You might have seen it. If you haven't, then you can go take a look at, Doug Christie, and look at his ice core sampling. And there's several several scientists that do this, and it's a re, it's a respected by all measurement. It's not used by the alarmist, but it's a respected by all measurement. So you you drive this this cylinder down into the ice. Probably Vostok in Greenland is common. You drive it down into the ice, 
you cap it off and you pull out the ice. And you take the ice and you profile it. And you can, t- you, you can time stamp the, you know, figure out, well, this is from 1800, this is from 1700, maybe the carbon dating. And then you measure the gases as this thing gets released. And so you can have an, an appreciation at some resolution you know, that you have CO2 measured accurately. And that the temperature, how they, how they determine the temperature from that is probably some clever trick with oxygen. So I don't really know. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's a technique that's generally accepted. It may not be accurate to, you know, 0. 0.001 degree centigrade. It's not. But, you know, it gives you a relative measure of the temperature and of the CO2. And there's a lot of people that believe in it. Patrick Moore is a good, a good uh, source for that. Okay, um, and a lot of us here are Christians. So, have you? Um, I find it very fascinating that the Old Testament talks about people who lived hundreds and hundreds of years, <laughs> and how there was a Pangaea, and then the Earth was divided. Yeah. Have you um, thought about if that could be explained at all by the changes in the atmosphere? Because I think the um, animals living inside the ocean they are hundreds of years, like the whales. And so could that be explained by changes in atmosphere? You know, that's a, that's a very good question. I can only give you a speculated guess. I think that, you know, pesticides and pollution and stress, all the things that shorten our lives, including whatever tried to take my life in cancer, I, you know, I think, I think that, uh, you know, we, we really have lived so far past our, our due date uh, of roughly about 40 years. Our evolutionary evolution, just pure science, says we should live 40 to whatever. And here I am at 76, just cooking right along. So, I, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a darn good question. I think, you know, the, the problem will be how science gets mixed in with other belief systems. And so that's the challenge in that particular arena. So let me, let me uh, answer that one, Angela. Please. So, <laughs> Yeah, I've done a bit of research on it. So the reason that we don't live as long is because our telomeres, every time our cells reproduce, the telomeres in the cells are shortened. If our telomeres didn't shorten, then the cells would not age and die. And at some point, the cell duplicates itself, and the telomeres are not long enough, and then the cell dies. And that's how we see cell damage, and that's why I have white hair, right? So that's what's happening. Why the telomeres in those cells have died, and so those cells have died or have been too short. So uh, what we found okay. out is if the telomeres aren't shortened, then you live a long life. And they can tell you how old you are just by measuring your telomeres. You have a telomere age, right? So that's one thing. So presumably before in the ancient times, uh, there wasn't as much radiation damage. And the radiation damage would come from when the sky, the cloud covering disappeared. And also when we had upheavals in the earth and we had radium and the radiation from the earth's core and stuff like that. So that then corrupts our DNA and then we die. Now, there was a point though, they did figure out that if you were able to perfect our telomeres as much as you could, um, they said as m- even if we were able to replicate the telomere, you would still die at 120 years. <laughs> Where have we heard that number before? <laughs> Right? It's in Genesis. God says, I'm not going to let anybody live past 120 years is enough. And it's really interesting that the scientists come up with that same number. So there are some possible, you know, there's relationships there. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I want to ask one more question from uh, Matthew. He said, uh, <laughs> but you talked about the, um, the calcium. He said, but is, aren't the coral reefs dying? Actually, the coral reefs are not dying. And, and I, would, I would send Matthew off to Mr. Red. What's his first name, I wonder? No, no, he's, he's, he got canceled in, in Australia for, and we donated to his legal fees and so on. But, you know, I think that, that what, you, what people don't understand is that the coral reef uh, shops at Costco, I'll put it that way to get, you know, kind of a comic angle here. And the coral reef is alive, but it takes in living creatures that give it, give it its color and allow it to grow. And so there's a lot of physics that I read about long ago, and Phil Reed, or Phil Red, it's Red, R-E-D-D. And so there's, there's some people that study this, and what they, what they found is that coral reefs, uh, you know, are very durable. And if you say that, you get fired. So, as Red did. 
So I think there's there's a lot of you know the acidification, not really coral reefs dying. They can overheat, you know, and then and and die because of the heat, and uh, and but you know that that uh, and they may recover. Yeah. So it's it's a complex system of which not many people have studied. Do you have any comments about the weather controlled? or government weather controlled out of Alaska called HARP with two A's? I don't. Weather control. So it's a satellite measurement system. Probably not a control system. Yeah. It's going to affect other. No, I, I, I'm not familiar with it. I'll take a look. It's H-A-A-R-P. Okay. Retired people are up to something, huh? So earlier you had um, mentioned an agricultural innovator. Norman Borlaug. Norman Bar... B-O-R... Bor... L-A-G? Borlaug. 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 Might be L-O-G. Okay. He's a 6'3", when he was alive, a 6'3 guy, totally dynamic. Totally dynamic guy, and when he died, some of his friends went back and you know because they'd been studying what he'd, impact he'd had. He saved a billion people's lives, one billion, and he did it without going to GMO foods because you can go to GMO; it's perfectly safe. GMO is good because what does GMO do? If it's done correctly, it can allow you to grow plants without pesticides. Right. If it's done correctly. If it's done correctly, exactly. So Bill Gates must have hated him. Yeah. <laughs> because he saved a billion he people, he right? He can't control. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, trying to condense so many things. Yeah, it was a, it was no, a bit no, of hours. No, yeah, normally the, you have, what, five presentations and or more. I, this would be roughly this plus the yeah. disclaimer part and the politic part would right. be at least five. Yeah. So I encourage everyone to uh, to seek out opportunities to, you know, to kind of break it down into smaller presentations where yeah. Dr. Gianna has the time to present, especially the political part. You, you'd be totally amazed at, at uh, the shenanigans from the UN and everything, quotes and books. These are not secrets. Yeah. All right, so I, uh, when uh, I met Dr. Gannon at a conference, a uh, Cato conference several years ago, uh, I knew that uh, disastrous global warming was BS for two reasons. And I, don't, I didn't know any of this stuff, and I still, I still don't understand the, the deep science or anything. First, there were many ice ages before, right? And that's prior to human population, prior to industry. So what caused dramatic changes in rising in temperature to melt the ice when there was no human population, no, you know, to speak of. So that's the thing. It's not new. The second thing, uh, global warming has been observed and measured, I suppose, on other planets in our solar system. No human population, no industry, no CO2, right? It's enclosed systems. Uh, you know, uh, that is something that really spoke, you know, proved to me that this is actually driven by the sun. Who would have thought? <laughs> some could possibly do such yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to mention those two things. If you ever talk to someone and you just, you know, you, you can't get into graphs, that stuff flies over my head like 90%, honestly. Uh, and I just, you know, I think it's torture for people to really, you know, get into climate modeling. There are very few people who are cold or have the vocation to go into that. The, yeah. Most of the population are never going to get deep into the equations. They don't have the math, uh, physics. Yeah. So uh, I feel for you that you're trying to convey things like that to people who are right now. It, it, is, it is a big thing, and I, there's got to be a better way is what I'm on a journey <laughs> of. So thank you. Well, do we have any more questions before we give them a final round? Yeah, we have a yeah. couple more. Uh, okay. Also, I do want to reiterate what Mike said is, so you have five classes that go into more detail, but you want to do it in a more intimate, smaller group. So if you're interested in that, definitely send me an email. I'll send okay. it to you. Yeah. So we can get this tapped into yeah. this group. Yeah. Uh, 
it. So with GMO and organic being like a huge issue with a lot of people today, to, uh, what you said earlier about the lobsters and the shrimps being grown in uh, low, like lower CO2 environments versus a higher CO2 environment, mm -hmm. technically couldn't you use the higher CO2 environment to create a, a uh, larger quantity of food? Uh, mm -hmm. other than what you have today. So like using greenhouses with a higher CO2 environment. In order Beautiful. To yeah, no, that's, that's, I commented on that. So you were probably uh, wondering what I was trying to say, but nevertheless, it, it, it does work that way. I think you go around the country, you drive around the country, and if you see a CO2 enclosed, uh, sorry, a greenhouse gas, a greenhouse effect container, and you'll see them down by the coast and so on, I think uh, not strawberries, but avocados, maybe, I don't know. But you'll see that they, they actually have a container outside that's pumping CO2 in, into that, sometimes as high as 2,000 parts per million. I need that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have a green thumb then? Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Oh, right here. So do you know uh, ESG? Yes. Oh, yeah. Would you like to explain a little bit on how, um, what we can, what you suggest that we can do to prevent that coming to, you know? Well, you know, I think, I think it, um, it was interesting because BlackRock is one of the big early proponents of environmental something, social, social yeah. governance. Yeah. So it's a way of getting into corporations and investors and forcing them to be climate alarmist effectively. They won't invest in companies that are fossil fuel oriented or advocate fossil fuels. So yeah, so ESG is a backdoor way of invoking the main reset in climate. And I, I think that, that, you know, it was interesting to see BlackRock come out, um, you know, they, they were saying, well, ESG, we're, the biggest ESG, we're, we're, you know, that's what we're requiring of our investments. And then if you, if you paid attention, happen to see the news around Sri Lanka and what happened in Sri Lanka, because what was going on there is they were rated very highly in ESG. So they said, we're, we're there, you know, we're doing the right thing. And then they starved, nearly starved to death and ran the king off wherever he is now. I don't know, he is on a boat somewhere trying to relabel, re have plastic surgery or something. I don't know. But, you know, I, th I, think, I think that this kind of, I won't say takes care of itself, but there will be a movement. Now, uh, Vivek uh, Rashwami is a guy that's fighting this very overtly. And he started a fund that's non-ESG called Strive. And so you can, you can look at that. And he's very, very good. He wrote Woke Inc., and has been in many articles. I think the world of this guy. He is brilliant and fast thinking. And he's he was an investor. It, you know, gave him the liberty to to move into activism. Okay, good. You mean this is Stride? The, the Stride. S T R I V E. Stride. Okay. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. So, we're so back. ESG. It's, they're like, oh, is that what you're talking about all the time? <laughs> so on the ESG side, um, one of the little sad tricks that they've got most Americans believing is, oh, just put your money in a, you know, index fund. You're going to be okay. The problem that that is, is that BlackRock, uh, Vanguard, uh, and Fidelity, other. all of them, they vote on behalf of the shares that your money is buying. And I was, you know, if you ever, if you ever want to sometime, go listen to some of the previous like Nike um, corporate uh, uh, quarterly calls, and you can hear the shareholder proposals during their shareholder meetings. And like out of 20 of them, 15 will be some form of ESG policy that they want the companies to pass. And the thing is, is that those companies, BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity, and the rest of them own 
a huge chunk of almost all of these companies through your investments in their index funds, whether it's an S and P 500 fund or, a, you know, that, you know, uh, Vanguard growth fund or something like that, but they vote on behalf of those shares. So the one, the fund that he's talking about is one where if you can do that in your 401k, then you're not allowing those companies to vote on your behalf in a way that's against their, like, I think there's Timothy funds, I think is another one that does that, oh, okay. but that that's honestly where they get a lot of that control from is our retirements. And they're using our retirements to vote against our beliefs to control policy. Yeah. Yeah. So the, so the goal of those funds are not to maximize for the shareholders, but for the stakeholders. And the word stakeholder really means everybody else except you, really. That's but, the word for that. But there are 18 state attorney generals that file suit saying you're not following what you're elected, what your bylaws say you should be doing. And then, what's his name, Rock? What's his name, the guy that's ahead of uh, Black. BlackRock? Larry Fink. And Larry Fink said, well, you know, we're really kind of trying to maximize shareholder value and... And we're, you know, we're in weasel words, you know, so that, that was, that was his attempt. So I think enough pressure from, you know, legal pressure and maybe even legislative. Okay. A couple more questions and then we should wrap up. Anybody else or are we done? Let me see if there's any, if Matthew has asked another one online. Yeah. Good for Matthew. Sandy's got to ask me one question. Sandy, come on. You'll ask me later. Okay. He's got a few more comments, but I'll, I'll try and connect his comments directly to you because they're not, okay. you know, a form of a question. So anybody else? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, let's uh, give Terry a hand here. Give me a hand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thanks for being Thanks here. Thanks for your hospitality. Yeah, yeah. Let's hope uh, we'll get enough interest for your, uh, for your other classes. Thank you all, and God bless, and we were late enough, so we'll dismiss you. And don't forget your dishes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, chairs. We need to put the chairs away. And uh, we also need some help with the table. So if any young men here, we need to put away the tables too. Thank you. Thank you all for bringing the food. We had a lot of fun. <laughs>